as the moderator of this first panel, we have um, a feast of ideas to get to. And so I'm going to try to start start on time. Welcome uh, to the opening and a full and rich day on the topic of drugs and public safety, exploring the impact of policy, policing, and prosecutorial reforms. I am uh, Doug Berman. I teach at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. I also uh, help direct the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center there. Uh, on behalf of everybody at Ohio State, I am incredibly grateful to the folks here at ASU's Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law and the Academy for Justice, especially uh, Eric and his whole team for not only getting us this great space, and I've been encouraged to encourage you to move down if you're so inclined, but uh, the space is so lovely and, and I'm sure some other people will be will be joining us soon. Uh, also incredibly grateful to, to my team at the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Just an enormous amount of work uh, went into making this day and yesterday's workshops uh, the success I already decided it is and that I know is going to continue, uh, starting with our first panel uh, on sentencing. Uh, and public safety. And um, I won't sort of preview the rest of the day. I know that's um, in your agendas and uh, you should certainly feel excited and I hope you'll be able to attend uh, as much of the event as possible. But we get off to an amazing start with three speakers, though you can't quite tell because only two are here. Unfortunately, uh, Sean Bushway, who's going to get us started, uh, is stuck in Albany because they actually have snow and he couldn't get out. But uh, he's with us. I am Cautiously hopeful Jennifer's coming to help us cue him in. Let me describe who Sean is, uh, though, briefly, in part because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our speakers. Uh, Sean is a senior policy re researcher at the Rand Corporation. He's also a professor at uh, SUNY Albany, where he received the Chancellor Award for Excellence in Scholarship. He spent most of his field, most of his career in the field of criminology, where he's been recognized as a distinguished scholar for the Division of Corrections and Sentencing and a fellow of the American Society of Criminology. Uh, there's a lot more to say. Are we, uh, is he up yet or? Getting there. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep reading his bio then. I think uh, if he speaks. Okay. Hello. Hello. There Stay he here. is, okay. excellent. All right, so Sean, I'm cutting off your bio because I wanna to get to you and I know you've got a lot to share with mm -hmm. us and I will introduce our other speakers when, when it's their turn to do opening remarks. The, vision here is to do you know 10 or 15 minutes of opening remarks, then maybe some Q&A that I moderate in between the panels and then open it up for questions uh, on this first set of topics on sentencing and public safety. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, okay. Um, I'd start my video, but it doesn't seem to want to let me, so um, I'm not hiding. Uh, and I do, uh, I, um, I feel bad that I'm not there, partly because I'd like to be there, and partly because it's snowy here and cold, uh, and I imagine it's not that way in Phoenix. Um, so when Doug asked me to do this, we talked a little bit about what some of the trends and patterns that are going on in sentencing, um, and um, hold on one second, I'm getting some chat, and uh, trying to get you up on the screen. Yeah, that, I'm getting the video says it I won't, it won't let me turn my camera on because the host won't let me. I'm trying to fix that. We're working on that, I think. So one of the interesting things when you talk about drugs and sentencing is a pattern that maybe some people know about and maybe some people don't, which is that there has been a remarkable decline in the racial disparity of people being sentenced in general in the United States, but particularly for drug crimes. Um, there's an important paper by Michael Light uh, looking at the federal sentencing system that argues that all of the racial disparity in the federal system for drug crimes has gone away. So what, what was a 54 month difference is now zero. Um, and there is a broader set of trends um, Often, and, and the main explanation for why is the decline in mandatory minimums, which there was an important paper by uh, Rehet, uh, by um, Rahabi and Starr showing that the mandatory minimums, particularly for drug crimes, uh, was one of the main reasons why there was large racial disparities in federal sentencing. Um, there was a, de a declaration by under, under the Obama administration to minimize mandatory minimums in the federal system. And 
the apparent effect of that was that the racial disparities have in fact dropped dramatically, if not disappeared. Um, understanding this increase, this amazing change, right? This is a big difference um, is really important, I think. And, and in, in a world where we often sort of sort of focus on the bad news. Um, I, I, we also seem to ignore good news. And this doesn't mean all the problems are solved or that we don't need to do anything else, but it, I think it's instructive to understand that this kind of major change can happen and try to understand what we can do to build on and learn from that experience. Um, that general pattern is actually, has been an important work by Bill Sable and his colleagues in the Council of Criminal Justice looking at massive racial disparity drops and racial disparities um, in sentencing more generally um, across a variety of stages, um, such that for men, what was an eight to one difference in incarceration is now less than five to one. Again, not solved, problems not solved. There's still lots of problems, but it's much less than it was. And trying to understand why that is, for women, it was six to one, it's now two to one. Um, in certain situations, there's a recent op-ed by Keith Humphreys showing that for Hispanics, it's actually one-to-one -one in many cases in incarceration. So trying to understand um, what has led to those changes and being able to build on those changes, I think is a really important part of the discussion um, and something that could be understood. And if we understand it, maybe we can build on and, and, and do better. So I think that was my main contribution was sort of pointing to these trends and try to understand what's going on. Also wanted to briefly, Doug uh, finds uh, my recent endeavor somewhat interesting. I'm now the chief narconomist for four high intensity drug trafficking areas, which is a grant program funded by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And uh, that means I'm applying economics and social science tools to um, uh, um, uh, to the issues of drug uh, curbing the drug supply. Um, there appears to be sort of massive changes in opioids in particular um, that could be affecting sentencing policy um, in terms of the way in which drug trafficking organizations operate in this country. Um, and so it, it, I don't think people are really thinking hard about that um, in terms of you know what, what are the implications if you have a, a, a serious change in policy here um uh and, and so i think you know the in particular the move from heroin to fentanyl and then from fentanyl powder to fentanyl pills uh could could be a very important thing to understand from from both in terms of what that means for the market in the us as well as for sentencing policy more more specifically so doug uh that's what i promised to tip chip off with i hope i hope it's okay and uh, maybe we can move on to the next guy next person sorry Thank you so much, John. And I think the, the theme of uh, there's good news out there is a great way to start. Uh, and, you know, they're also, you know, keeping in mind that public safety also includes giving continued thought to racial disparities and changes in that, both in the drug sentencing space and other sentencing spaces is, is very powerful. And I, and I actually hope, uh, especially as we're getting you on the screen, uh, that you'll have a chance soon to talk about um, some of your Heidel work as well, uh, perhaps in our Q&A. But I'm going to now shift for, for opening remarks to Jonathan Robluski. Jonathan is the director of the Office of Policy and Legislation in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. He's also been director of the Harvard Law School Semester in Washington program since 2010. Uh, in his role at the DOJ, uh, he leads a team of policy analysts and attorneys in developing, reviewing, and evaluating national crime, sentencing, and corrections policy and legislation. Uh, he also represents the Department of Justice as the ex officio member uh, of the U.S. Sentencing Commission now. Uh, I, again, could go on and on and on, uh, including that uh, he's a longtime friend and I'm incredibly grateful. He's joined us here to give his perspective on the interplay between sentencing issues, drug policy, and public safety. Thank you, Doug. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, it's especially a pleasure to get out of Washington, D.C. now and then for a few days. Um, thank you, Doug and Yana and Eric and everyone at Arizona State University and Ohio State University for putting this together and including me. Um, it's very gratifying to hear Sean begin 
talking about some progress on reducing racial disparities. My first experience as a policy lawyer after being a prosecutor and a public defender was um, at the Sentencing Commission in 1994, where um, together with a, a data analyst named Lou Reed, um, we wrote the first report on federal cocaine sentencing policy and the disparity between uh, crack and powder cocaine sentencing, which I think has become the symbol of racial disparities. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about all of that in a few minutes. Um, the theme of my remarks will be cycles of drug use and regulation in America and why those cycles make the craft of sentencing policymaking so important in the pursuit of justice. Um, but before I get to that, a quick note, I know there are a few students here and I wanna just um, send them a little shout out and tell them how wonderful it is that they're part of this. Um, I've had the pleasure of teaching for most of my career um, and candidly, it's the joy of my professional life. The students bring the energy and the spirit to all of this. We old people bring experience um, and we need each other. Um, and I hope that um, the students here will participate and share their thoughts on all of the issues that we're gonna talk about. Um, one other thing for those students and for anybody else, somewhere in my talk is embedded some Taylor Swift lyrics. So it's mostly to see if you're paying attention. Um, shout out if you hear them, okay? So these kinds of events can um, end up being, I think, very important to our development as lawyers and scholars and policymakers. When I was a much, much younger person during the presidency of Bill Clinton, there was a director of the National Institute of Justice named Jeremy Travis. And besides handing out money to um, academics to do research, he thought it might be a good idea to have a lecture series where he brought, where he would bring in um, uh, scholars, academics to talk about criminal justice from various perspectives. He rented out a hotel ballroom near Capitol Hill. He invited people from the Justice Department and um, the Congress and nonprofit organizations. I thought those kinds of things are really, really important. At one of those lectures, um, I heard a Dr. David Musto, who was a professor of history at the Yale Medical School, and he was an expert on the history of substance use and regulation in America. And candidly, it changed the way that I think about all of this. Musto explained way back then that the history of alcohol and drug use and its regulation in the United States is a history of cycles. Each of these cycles generally lasts around 80 years. They include periods of permissiveness and periods of temperance. Um, during those periods of permissiveness, alcohol and drugs are viewed as medicine and healthy recreation. And during the periods of temperance, they're viewed as poison and the destroyer of all virtue. Um, and I'm sure many of you know this history. Um, during the colonial period up through the early 1800s, um, the Europeans who came to this country um, loved to drink beer, and they drank a lot of it, um, enough to make, I think, um, uh, to embarrass even the uh, fraternity brothers at uh, Arizona State University. They thought it was part of a healthy lifestyle, um, and they thought um, that it was good recreation. Um, but in the 1800s, uh, the first temperance movement began in the United States. Um, many of you, of course, are familiar with prohibition, where our country changed our constitution to prohibit um, the sale of alcohol, but you may not know that in the 1800s, most of the states at that time prohibited alcohol consumption and sales. There was prohibition back then. That lasted till around the Civil War. Then from the end of the Civil War until the beginning of the 1900s, we had another period of permissiveness. That included periods of time when we had when people saw heroin, which was a product marketed by a pharmaceutical company named Bayer out of Germany, they saw that as um, a great um, assistance to a healthy, a healthy life. 
Um, we decided to put cocaine in our drinks, like in Coca-Cola, because we thought it was going to help us live a healthy life. Um, and of course, that lasted until roughly the end of, uh, of the 1800s. And we had our second temperance movement, which culminated in prohibition and the change in our constitution. After that, up until the night from the end of prohibition until the 1970s, we had another period of permissiveness. Some of you may have watched television shows like Mad Men and um, others from the period of the 1960s and 70s. This was the time of my youth when people went out to lunch and had three martinis at lunch. Um, they smoked um, regularly all over the place. Um, alcohol, cocaine, heroin um, became widespread. Um, until, of course, we had um, our third temperance movement, and that's colloquially known as the War on Drugs. Um, that lasted until the 2010s, and as I see it, we're living through our fourth period of permissiveness now. Um, it seemed that Musto had it so right. His lecture happened in the early 1990s, and it seemed like just a few months after his lecture in California, there started to be news reports about how marijuana could cure childhood seizures for those afflicted with them. Now, with the ebb and flow of society's views about alcohol and drugs come the ebb and flow of sentencing policy. And the observation I want to put forward is that if the policy development process is working and functional, a fairly well-defined cycle of sentencing policy will coexist alongside the changing views of drugs and will just slightly lag behind those changes in society's views about alcohol and drug consumption. If these two cycles roughly correspond, sentencing policy will be and will be seen most of the time as bending towards justice. That justice will be more punitive in the middle years of the temperance phase of the cycle and less punitive during a permissive phase. But in both cases, I would suggest it, it will be seen as just as it responds to public views and those changing public views. On the other hand, if the policy development process is dysfunctional, it won't be seen like that. The cycles will run, will not run congruently, and there will be less justice. Now, the way I sometimes like to think about all this is, um, is that it's like greyhound racing. Doug, is there any greyhound racing anymore? Does it even exist? Do you know? It's a great question. I don't know. I'm okay. sure we do it on our phones. So, somehow, but yeah, I, I don't know if it still exists. But for those of you who've never seen greyhound racing, it's run on an oval track. And there's a mechanical robot that runs on a rail around the track. The dogs chase the rabbit. And the rabbit is what I would, I would suggest is the public opinion about drugs. It changes as time moves forward, as generations change, as we forget the lessons of the past. The greyhounds, on the other hand, are the policymakers. They see the rabbit and they chase it. And if policymakers keep up with public opinion, justice will most often be served. If the policy-making dogs fall behind, it won't. Now, keeping up with the rabbit means functional policy-making. And for policy-making to be functional, there needs to be both policy-making craft, and what I mean by that is negotiation, clear thinking, persuasion, coalition building, innovation. For those of you who were here last night, um, we saw that personified in Congressman Joyce in his interview with Eric. But there also needs to be the production of knowledge to feed the craft and the policy process and attention by policymakers. Policymaking craft matters. Scholarship and research matter. Attention matters. To me, these are all part of a functioning democracy. Unfortunately, we live in a time of not just great division, but great distraction. Some of you, I'm sure, are reading and writing emails right now. Some of you may be on TikTok right now. Now, when our policymakers get distracted, they lack the focus and attention on policy. Imagine the greyhounds not chasing the rabbit, but off to the side of the track, chatting with Rachel Maddow, Tucker Carlson, raising money, or just making trouble. 
Now, I'm old enough to remember when Congress used to not only pass defense authorization bills every Congress and every year, but pass authorization bills for most, um, uh, most cabinet departments um, in the government. They used to pass 12 appropriation bills. They used to hold oversight hearings on virtually every decent sized program within the federal government. And they used to also get all this work done by Columbus Day, and that's when the session would end. Needless to say, that's not the way it works now. Many of our policymakers often lack policy craft and are driven by corrupt motives, and sometimes they lack the necessary information to make intelligent policy. This can all lead to a disconnect or a significant lag between the cycles of public opinion and the views of alcohol and drug use and sentencing policy that governs its regulation. Professor Sullivan, in his paper, which I reviewed uh, yesterday, called that stagnation of federal drug laws. Now, let me briefly try to make this a little more concrete because I've seen repeated over and again a life cycle of drug policy. It starts with information or knowledge of a policy problem. Then there's a political imperative to act on that problem. There's policy change and innovation, usually pretty lazy and uninformed, but not always. Then there's more and better information, and then hopefully some policy adjustments or reform, again, so long as there, are ten there is attention. And let me use the example of cocaine sentencing policy again. When I was a public defender, I worked in Oakland, California, and it happened to be at the time of the introduction of crack cocaine into Oakland. Now, Oakland in the mid 1980s was a very, very dangerous place. Uh, there were, in 1986, there were 150 murders in Oakland, and I remember it all too well. Yes, you got it. Okay. Now, Oakland had about 350,000 people at the time. Yes, I knew someone was paying attention. New York has roughly 20 times the population of Oakland. If it had the same murder rate that Oakland had in 1986, it would have around 3,000 murders a year. Last year, after this apparently huge increase in murders from the pandemic, New York had 400 murders. Now, Oakland, and the only reason I say all that is just to give some perspective about how dangerous Oakland was. And it was perceived as being related to the introduction of crack cocaine. I'm not suggesting that that knowledge and that information was correct, but that was the knowledge. And it led to a political imperative, including an imperative by the African-American community in Oakland for policy change. And so here were a couple of things that happened. The Oakland Police Department created something called Special Duty Unit 2. And that, and, and that group of officers who were mostly African-American would go out each evening and have and make five or so hand-to-hand, -hand, one rock, $20 crack cocaine buys, and they would arrest the dealers. The thinking was that if we do this for a couple of months, it will all be over because there will be no more dealers left. It seems so silly now. Uh, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, we also thought it would be over in 30 or 60 days if we just did a few things. At the same time, 2,500 miles away, Congress was passing mandatory minimums. In 1986, they passed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, and they said that if you possess with intent to distribute five grams of crack, you would get a five-year mandatory minimum sentence. Now, over time, the knowledge changed, and there was more knowledge. And let me just give you one example. By 1994, when I was at the Sentencing Commission, the Sentencing Commission decided to expand its data collection effort to start tracking the drug type involved in drug cases. And they identified very quickly that in crack cocaine cases, over 90% of the defendants were African American. And that was very troubling to a lot of people. And Congress in the 1994 crime bill 
told the commission, you need to write a report and you need to tell us how this should change. So more information, there should be some reform. And with Kraft, the policy would have adjusted, but that's not what happened. The commission had a very, very serious misstep. The commission didn't negotiate effectively with itself, with Congress, or with the Clinton administration. And if you go back to our metaphor on the Greyhound track, it got in front of the rabbit. And the result of all of that was catastrophic. I was sitting in the room when the commission voted four to three to eliminate the disparity. And I was there when Congress passed a law to reject that, which was signed by President Clinton. And the cost of that mistake was 15 years before the Congress would actually amend the law. And during that 15 years, during those 15 years, 70,000 people, 70,000 additional people were sentenced under that 100 to 1 crack disparity. Now, it wasn't all bad news. There were other adjustments th that were made as knowledge expanded, including something called the safety valve, a cap on the drug table, drugs minus two, the First Step Act. They were modest, but cumulatively, they made a difference. Um, and it's uh, gratifying, I say, as I said before, to hear about that. Now, there are things happening right now that require our attention. And there are a few lessons from all of this that I take away. Um, what's happening right now is despite the fact that we're in a period of permissiveness, there's this substance called fentanyl that's killing 100,000 people, 100,000 of our fellow citizens, which is absolutely astonishing to me that we're still in a period of permissiveness despite that. But it just shows the force um, of some of these um, uh, generational changes. Now, some of the lessons very quickly is, number one, that there is a critical need for more and better information. The information is needed to drive thoughtful policy change. We need scholarship. We need more data. We need more research. We need more ideas. Um, and after my first day here, we need it more than just on marijuana. <laughs> Um, and what are the right research questions? A lot of it is what Sean talked about. Who are the manufacturers? Who are the wholesalers? What are the changing demographics, the changing trafficking patterns, all of that. The second lesson I take is that we have to recognize the cycles and make sure that adjustments can be made in a timely way when the cycle reverses and when we have more knowledge. And I'll just suggest one innovation that I think um, doesn't get enough attention, and that's the idea of legislative sunsets. These sunsets require legislators to look at the policy. So whether they want to go off and talk to Rachel Maddow on the side of the track, they have to get back on the track and they have to legislate. You're seeing that right now on legislation related to fentanyl analogs. You saw that in certain provisions of the Patriot Act, it forces politicians to pay attention. And then finally, um, one of the lessons is it's really important to study and focus on the craft of policymaking. Now, it's not as fun as advocacy. I know that. It's much more fun to get up and righteously describe um, the racism, and the horrors of the past, and how we need to hit some vision far away. And that's much more fun than getting in there and negotiating something that's half a loaf. But it's just as important. And if we don't do it well, we'll never be able to reverse the policies as our views change. So those are some of the things that I was thinking about. I apologize for taking too long. No, Thank no, you, Doug, for inviting me. A and absolutely I wonderful. Thank you so much for those comments. I always had an inkling that you were a Swifty, but it's nice to have it confirmed uh, this morning. And and I believe it was Taylor Swift who said that uh, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And so uh, another important, valuable lesson to hear about the cycles and your your wonderful 
perspectives on them. I'm going to warn all the panelists that the data point that you, you sort of leaned into at the beginning of your closing closing ideas is something I'm going to want to come back to and come back to in, in a variety of ways um, after we first get a chance to hear from Gracie Johnson. Uh, Gracie leads the Last Prisoner Project's policy team, which works to advance retroactive relief from individuals harmed by cannabis criminalization. LP is a, LPP is a national nonprofit working at the intersection of cannabis and criminal justice reform. Uh, Gracie created and leads the LPP policy team, which provides nonpartisan evidence-based technical assistance to jurisdictions working uh, to roll back cannabis prohibition. Again, a lot more I could say, but I saw you nodding, rightly so, because both the data point and uh, the challenge of the craft of policymaking, I know, has been central to the work that you've been doing. And so uh, thank you for joining us this morning, and, and please share your thoughts. Thank you so much, Doug, and thank you so much to the universities for having us. We're so excited to be here. Um, so my name's Gracie. I'm with LPP, um, like Doug said, and um, I was vigorously nodding with Jonathan's points because um, I might be the the outlier, but I actually do find um, the uh, the sausage making really fun. Um, I am not a marijuana advocate, um, even though I work at a marijuana um, justice organization. I come to this work from the traditional criminal justice reform space, and um, my job is to bring data to policy problems um, and to to help lawmakers um, and advocates and criminal justice practitioners and just interested citizens, all different types of stakeholders. Um, my job is to help them make smart decisions um, with common sense policy. Um, and I do actually find that it is really fun, really frustrating often at times, especially in the town that this guy lives in, um, but really fun to figure out the puzzle of how to get people that um, hate each other on a lot of different types of issues issues to come sit together at a table and um, figure out a path forward. Um, and that's what we do at LPP. We are trying to advance retroactive relief policies in all of the states that are moving um, toward legalization um, and in the states that have already moved toward legalization, um, but have forgotten already, like Jonathan mentioned, where they came from, um, forgotten the reason that a lot of people even came to, um, to vote for legalization in the first place. Um, they've forgotten, you know, to be accountable to the origins of prohibition, which were, you know, this disparate um, enforcement, bad outcomes, um, just a really bad return on a public safety investment. It was just a, a failed policy, right? We, um, I think some foundational elements to just lay right here um, that I think hopefully everyone in this room can agree on is um, cannabis prohibition failed. Um, incarceration in general in America is out of control in terms of its costs and its scope. Um, and it doesn't have a good um, return on its public safety investment in terms of how much it costs um, our, our dollars. Um, and those dollars are spent um, incarcerating people um, that perhaps don't need to be incarcerated and those dollars go away. They're not being used for other, um, perhaps more pressing public safety concerns. So those are kind of some foundational elements that we come to this work with. Um, and so again, you know, I'm not a marijuana advocate. Um, I'm a, a criminal justice policy consultant. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons um, that we wanted to talk about cannabis specific resentencing today, because I spent a lot of time in the criminal justice reform policy space. Um, oftentimes um, frustrating time um, because uh, as the cycles that Jonathan um, mentioned, um, I've seen a couple of those um, and, and something that I think is kind of central to cannabis resentencing um, that I bring from my criminal justice reform um, policy experience is this notion of sustainable policies um, sustainability is really important to the work that we do. Um, I think sometimes the, um, the viral wins, um, can, can push advocates and sometimes, um, portions of the public in a certain direction, um, that the data doesn't always, um, back up. And I think especially in the particularly polarized times that we find ourselves in, um, we're seeing some really discouraging instances of unsustainable policy. Um, and so just taking off my professional hat for a second, and just as a human, I, I'm troubled by situations in which I've seen criminal justice reforms 
um, be repealed <laughs> after there's been any evidence, um, any time to, to collect evidence and show that they that they were bad policy um, just because of the political winds um, that were around them. So, you know, there's uh, several examples that I could mention, but, you know, in one state where I've worked, um, they passed one political party on, you know, in every committee um, on party line votes, just really shoved a huge progressive criminal justice reform agenda down the throats of the opposing party. And the opposing party came back the next year and they ran on a campaign promise to repeal that policy. That policy was promises to families, um, people who were incarcerated, that they were going to receive um, shorter sentences. And the the party came and they won. Um, and um, that's not that's not policy at the end of the day, right? That's politicking. Um, but people's lives were affected. And so just as a human, I'm troubled by that. But as a as a policy consultant, I'm I'm also troubled by it, but I'm informed by it, right? I, I want to see us design and I work my team, we work with individuals and groups in states to design sustainable policies. And that's where we come to cannabis resentencing. Um, because cannabis, as we've been hearing about this week, um, as we hear about in the news all the time, is an area where people can come together more and more. And um, these days, it's what is the, the green rush that's sweeping the, the nation? It's it's a relatively non-controversial topic in comparison <laughs> to uh, to things like um, traditional sentencing reform. It's still obviously very, very controversial in many of the states in which we work, um, but it's much less controversial than, say, um, sex offender registry reform. Right. So that's that's also work that I've done. And um, those are those are two different rooms. <laughs> um, so. Um, I think that the momentum around marijuana reform in general, particularly driven by people who come to it because they're troubled by what they've seen, um, the effect of prohibition has wrought. Um, I think, you know, it's particularly compelling to see that momentum um, kind of sweep across the country and we're seeing legalization. Um, but I, I really like a phrase that popped up um, a couple of times yesterday. Legalization is not legalization is not legalization. And that's kind of the ditch in which <laughs> my team um, works, um, because especially when it comes to retroactive relief policies, um, we are still very much figuring it out. Um, we are still very much as a country um, figuring out legalization, right? Um, and that's been happening for many more years than retroactive relief policies coupled with legalization have been around. So um, prior to my work at LPP, I was a founding member of the Clean Slate Initiative, um, which is a policy that some of you may be familiar with. It's just automatic record clearance for just different categories of offenses. Um, and, you know, that wasn't, um, it's, it's become quite, quite popular, um, but that wasn't so long ago. That was literally just six years ago. It was the first um, clean slate law that that we got passed. And since then, you know, there's been a lot of bipartisan consensus and, um, you know, a lot of agreement around um, the idea of automatic expungement. We use the term record clearance as kind of just a more um, inclusive umbrella term, but the, the term that you all might um, be more uh, familiar with is expungement. And so um, when we're talking about automatic expungement, that's that's now become kind of like a, a kitchen table, um, you know, term when when it comes to legalization movements, right? Oh, did it have those social justice provisions? Did it have automatic yeah. expungement in it? In it? Um, and we've seen that trend just rapidly pick up in the last couple of years. So automatic expungement was not really a thing <laughs> until um, six or seven years ago. It, it like literally did not exist. Um, record clearance mechanisms were um, were fully petition based. They still are in most places, and that's a problem. We have a whole host of evidence that shows that that petition based um, record clearance processes are simply broken. But I won't go into that today because I think that the point of this is that we've learned a lot from the failures of our record clearance um, provisions, and we need to apply those lessons to the future of resentencing and release when it comes to um, marijuana justice um, in particular. And um, in particular, <laughs> this issue, I think, is really compelling because it 
it gives us a blueprint for broader criminal justice reform. That's the philosophy within which I lead our work. Um, because again, I'm not a marijuana advocate. I'm I'm someone that um, wants to see broader criminal justice reforms that are grounded in the data that shows us that people age out of crime, that long sentences don't deter crime, um, that people that commit offenses before the time that their brain was fully developed should receive a second look at their sentences. You know, we have all of this evidence evidence that shows us that there should be broader um, reforms around our sentencing system. And I see um, marijuana specific resentencing as a way to really build that proof of concept to show people in states where there are still lots of electeds um, that the that are afraid of marijuana um, or are uncomfortable with it, like our like our commander in chief um, and many like him. Um, that the sky doesn't fall when you build a categorical pathway to sentence reconsideration for a uh, narrow, in the grand scheme of things, um, a narrow uh, schema of individuals who are incarcerated. So when we're talking about cannabis resentencing, from our perspective, um, we're talking about, we're not talking about automatic release valves. We're not talking about opening the prison doors tomorrow. We're talking about individuals getting um, a sentence review in front of a judge to reconsider um, the term that they're serving in either jail, prison, or um, on community supervision, like probation or parole, um, in light of legalization, in light of the state changing their, their posture on criminalizing um, this substance. And the population that we're talking about um, gets tricky, as I was talking with Jonathan about this morning. Um, one of the biggest problems we have um, in building um, uh, not momentum around resentencing, but building education around resentencing, because I think um, especially the people closer to my age in this room might see on uh, social media, there's a very top popular term, you know, no one should be in prison for weed. Well, there's hardly any laws on the books in this country that reflect that. Um, but there's 21 states in this country, um, three territories and D.C. that have legalized cannabis. So why is there that disconnect um, between between the rabbit and the dog? Why are we seeing um, this this fundamental disconnect that people are saying we messed up prohibition? We need to end it, not just because we want to make a lot of money in this new legal industry, but because it was fundamentally wrong and the data shows us that we failed. So why is there this disconnect in the black letter of the law that we see now? Why is there also a disconnect between the black letter of those 21 laws and what's happening on the ground in those states? So of those 21 states, there's only nine that have passed cannabis specific resentencing provisions and they've been not good enough for two main reasons, um, substance and procedure. They've been um, far too limited um, and um, in, in those two ways. So um, we're talking about an eligibility scheme of individuals who, you know, we heard some stories about um, people like, like Weldon and Luke. Um, yesterday, there are thousands of more people like them um, that are serving for cases related to cannabis, but they are not in broad scale, um, not in huge numbers, serving state custody or federal BOP custody for simple possession of marijuana. That's just, that's simply not true. People are not serving um, long prison sentences for the single offense that gets removed from the criminal code when a state moves to legalize. Sometimes it's also, you know, um, PWID possession with intent to distribute, but by and large for purposes of generalizing for this conversation, when a state legalizes, it's really just legalizing simple possession um, but it's shifted, it's fundamentally shifted um, its posture toward criminalization. It's not just said, we're gonna look the other way. Um, it's saying, we're, we're not only gonna look the other way, we're gonna remove it from our criminal code and we're gonna stand up an entire new regulated marketplace where a lot of people, including us, will make dollars from this. That is a huge shift 
that is completely out of alignment with the criminal code in all of the states that have legalized. Because um, like I said, only a few of those states, so less than half of the 21 that have legalized have updated their criminal code in, in one attempt to provide a pathway to sentence um, reconsideration and release for individuals. Um, only two of those have created a pathway that is what we refer to as state initiated. Um, I mentioned automatic expungement before. Um, I think that's a that's a good buzzword for people generally understanding the issue, but it has kind of gotten convoluted over the last couple of years where people think automatic means immediate and immediate means overnight. And that's just not true. So we, we prefer the term state initiated or self-effectuating. And basically what I mean by that is that you don't have to do the thing to get the thing that you deserve, um, that you are eligible for under the new law. So the state has to um, take the onus to provide the pathway to the relief that they say you are eligible for. Um, and so unfortunately, on the resentencing side, we're seeing a much slower trend toward those self-effectuating um, pathways to relief. On the record clearance side, um, like I said, we've had an incredibly encouraging last five years. When I first got into the record clearance um, side of the business, um, it was not really known about. Um, we were having um, arguments with people that we thought would be on our side of the issue, like defense attorneys who didn't understand why the petition-based process wasn't good enough, in part because they had um, a fiscal interest in that process, right? But but we have totally shifted, um, at least in, in the policy space, um, on both sides of the aisle with a very diverse group of supporters across the country when it comes to, yep, the petition-based record clearance um, system is broken. We need to automate it. And um, particularly when it comes to legalization campaigns, it's now being included. Um, last year, it's 2023. So in 2021, 100% of the states that legalized actually included, so two years ago, included automatic record clearance um, mechanisms. So that's great. The cannabis um, resentencing hasn't hasn't quite caught up. And the, those two buckets in terms of um, the limitations are the eligibility. They're not including everyone that should receive, again, not automatic release, but a second look, um, a sentence reconsideration. Um, so people that have cannabis related offenses, not just simple possession cases, people who are serving concurrent sentences, so maybe a firearms case, but also a cannabis case, and perhaps cannabis is the reason that they encountered law enforcement in the first place, um, and people who are serving enhanced sentences for maybe, again, things unrelated to cannabis, but they have an enhancement from a prior cannabis sentence. So we want a bigger population of people to receive those sentence reconsiderations. That's the first limitation. The laws so far are far too narrow. Um, the couple that we have just say, you know, you, you can get a resentencing hearing if you're serving for something that's not legal. And that's actually no one in the states that have passed it. It's, it's literally no one. Um, and then the other problem is around procedure. So like I mentioned with the state initiation of the process, um, when an individual has to know about a law change, they have to have the wherewithal and the resources and hopefully the family support network to help them get a lawyer to navigate that system. They have to take the time and um, the burden of hope that might be futile um, to go through a sometimes years long process to ask a court for relief that should be provided just because of a change in the law in the first place. So again, it's on eligibility that those, those resentencing um, statutes are too limited so far, as well as on procedure, that access is just not being um, provided to people. So, um, you know, I think the, the elements here that are important to us are around access to the policy um, around sustainability of the policy across political lines. This is not a blue or red policy. It's just smart common sense policy. Um, but it's also not just logical policy. It's backed by evidence. Like I mentioned, that shows that, you know, there's, there's a huge and growing body of evidence that shows that long sentences in general <laughs> need, um, need addressing, right? So some of you may be familiar with the, the movement around second look policies, which is just, you know, not cannabis specific sentence reconsideration, right? So, so those are the kind of elements that we're talking about um, when we're talking about cannabis resentencing. Um, and, um, you know, I'll kind of end with this. I think, like I said, in the beginning, we, we really see cannabis resentencing as the proof of concept for broader um, legal system reforms. It is, um, I, I agreed with so much of what you were saying, Jonathan, because it is, um, 
it's incredibly difficult to get people to agree on law changes, um, especially at the federal level. But luckily, that's not where the, the true impact is, is going to be felt when it comes to individuals who deserve retroactive relief when it comes to the criminalization of cannabis. Um, it's at the state and local level. And um, people don't always get along, right? This is an issue where we can bring people to the table. Um, we can get them to feel good about a policy. That's a great way to get um, an individual to an, an elected to run on that policy, you know, for their reelection campaign to come back and say, you know, I've worked in a bunch of states where I've helped, um, I've helped a senator or, or um, a representative pass a law and they felt really good about it because they got a lot of good press and they got a lot of calls, right? And then they come back and they say, we want to do more. Um, it's, it's hard to start with something huge. Um, it's, it's hard to start with something that sounds like open the prison doors for a whole list of people tomorrow. doesn't matter what political party you're affiliated with. That's hard. Um, you need to find something that, um, builds consensus, builds goodwill, um, among groups of people that no, don't normally sit down together. Like, um, like, uh, representative Joyce said last night, him and AOC, um, we need more of that, um, in order to build the proof of concept for broader, um, justice reforms. And we really see cannabis resentencing as the way to do that. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Gracie. And, and Sean, I'm going to loop you in if, if, if you're there, because I think, uh, not only do I want to give you a chance maybe to respond to some of what you've heard from from us here, but especially this idea of return on investment. Uh, I think I'm describing your position with Haida Wright as, as a narconomist. Uh, and so I tend to think of return on investment as kind of an economic principle. And I don't know if that's a part of both the way in which Haida kind of thinks about how they invest their time and their resources, or if it's just kind of your own sense of the value from from other research that you've done, and and maybe have Jonathan weigh in on this as well. If among the ways to be thinking about developing data, among the ways to communicate to those greyhounds as they're chasing the rabbit, is whether you think this is good politics or even good policy, we always have to keep an eye on return on investment because we live in a world of scarcity, and and uh, it's not can this work? It's can this work well relative to our other options? And I know that's a big part of in the drug reform space, harm reduction and other uh, ideas that are there as well. So I just would love to get your take on, you know, whether and how return on investment is a is a kind of a good thinking and talking point uh, based on your experience. Again, maybe even describe a little bit of what, you know, what height is up to and how they function, because I'm not sure everybody knows even what height is are, uh, and especially how that fits in with some of the other work that I know you've done, you know, studying other other aspects of the justice system. Okay. Um, I should learn that when the, a lawyer tells you th that you should <laughs> speak for less than five minutes, that he means 15, um, <laughs> particularly when the panel is mostly lawyers. Um, but I actually found, I found both presentations really interesting, so I wouldn't shorten them. Uh, so I think the first thing I would say is that as, a, as an economist, I want to sort of I, I actually agree wholeheartedly with Gracie's point about sort of the, you know, if you're going to say that these things aren't illegal now, you should probably look back and look at who you punished before. I, I, I think I want to push back a little bit on the idea that marijuana policy in the past was a failure in the sense that if the goal was to reduce consumption uh, of marijuana, it was successful. Um, whether it was worth the cost, now this is the return on investment part, is an open question, and, that, and, and the agreement seems to be that it wasn't. But the idea that it sort of didn't do in part what it was supposed to do, I find um, problematic. And I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming that what's happened in the places where legalization has occurred is that the supply curve has shifted out in some cases quite dramatically, resulting in large drops in prices, even with high taxes, and consumption has increased because of that. In addition, the demand curve has increased because people who wouldn't use it before will now use it because it's legal. And the result has been massive increases in, in drug uh, use. Now, maybe that's okay, um, but that is a fact. Um, but the other part of it is, I think that from a policy shift perspective, I think if you look at the RAND documents on this is particularly good, that we didn't really have any way of knowing what was going to happen. 
And so there was predictions about massive drops in price and big increases in, in consumption. Um, but one of the things that we didn't see coming is uh, in those documents at RAND was the massive changes in use patterns in terms of the, ty the types of marijuana that's being used and the huge increase in THC, right? So under the old days, the 17% THC rates were pretty common. And now in some products, you can get THC rates as high as 95%. That's dramatic, and the and the implications of that I don't think are well understood, right? We're not talking about your dad's marijuana anymore, and so I think it's important to understand that that, that policies have have impacts, and we can argue about whether they're good ideas or whether their costs are worth it. But but that policy did have the 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 effect of reducing consumption and changing the, the modes of, 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 of marijuana. So uh, again, that's just a, an a important point to point out. And I think it's worth talking about in the context of, of the HIDAs. So what HIDAs are, it's, a, it's basically a, fund, a grant funding uh, opportunity through the White House, where they provide money to try to coordinate state and local law enforcement against um, uh, drug supply. They also provide money for treatment, although the majority of what they do is on the supply side. So it's like 75, 25, something like that. Um, and the sort of implications of why they're going down this rate of having an economist and thinking about narconomics is that they generally don't think about return on investment. They don't think about, okay, strategically, if we were trying to do this, what would you do? Um, did, we did this. Did that work? That's not how it's a, the general approach. The general approach is more of a bottom-up work with confidential informants. Um, and there isn't a lot of even baseline data on, okay, so what's the, what is the supply? You know, what is the market size in, in local area X? And how would we know if we made a difference? And is this the policy, the right thing to do? And so there isn't really a framework for that. Um, in that same way of understanding whether the policies and approaches are actually making an impact. Um, and that's part of what we're trying to change. And I think it's not just us. Uh, there's movements within DEA to improve measurement and data in this context as well. But it is, I think, a, a fundamental shift that says we are going to think more strategically about uh, how we do drug enforcement in this country. And we try to look at whether what we're doing is effective or not. Um, and trying to understand the larger markets, uh, I think, are important. So um, it, it, we'll see if it's effective or if it can work. It is a fundamental change in how people think about things, but it's sometimes worth to give these things a shot. Um, but uh, it does change also just how you think about data, right? And most of the people in law enforcement think about data as information used in cases. And this is a different use of that information. And and it requires a bit of an of, uh, change in the way people think about data um, because it requires sharing data and things like that. Uh, and you don't share data that are that are in cases because that could affect the case. Um, and so uh, you know that that's those are some of the things that we think about in that context. Very helpful. And I'm actually going to return to the data idea with a particular focus on recidivism questions in a minute. It's also I'm perhaps going to overuse the Greyhound and uh, rabbit metaphor, but I wanted to give Jonathan a moment to maybe speak to return on investment ideas and whether that's fundamental to your vision of data and well-crafted policymaking. I, I think it's very important and can be very, very helpful, um, but the it, it can't just be an analysis of somebody else's idea, like, oh, your idea stinks because it's going to be very costly and it's not going to do very much. There has to be an answer because, again, the pattern that I keep seeing is there's a problem and there's a political imperative to do something about the problem. And candidly, the legislators don't know what to do about the problem. They're relying on advocates and scholars. And, and, and if they don't know what to do, they'll default to the lazy answers, which is, OK, let's start arresting the guys who are selling the one rocks on that corner in East Oakland. Or let's raise penalties, let's add two levels on the sentencing guidelines. And so having analyses that um, that identify um, uh, policy steps that can work and can be cost effective, I think is great. Now, 
I've, I've seen that in the past. So it doesn't always be, it's not always sentencing, but we also have to have humility to understand that our initial take on the cost benefit may end up being wrong. So for example, um, uh, when methamphetamine was um, starting to spread around the country and there were labs all over the place, the answer was let's take the let's take the precursor chemicals and put them behind the counter and um, and make them more difficult to obtain. Okay, that that ended up having the unintended consequence of pushing all the methamphetamine production to Mexico. Um, and all kinds of other problems happened as a result. So it has to be an ongoing um, set of research about cost, benefits, effectiveness. I think that's all really important. And if I can just add something quickly, Doug, I think what's central to both of these comments is um, perhaps one of the, the least sexy things um, <laughs> in the criminal justice reform movement, which is data collection and oversight and performance monitoring. It's like not exciting to talk about. It doesn't get legislators super excited to say, hey, can you run a report bill or a data collection bill? Um, but it is integral to everything that, um, that was just talked about here. Um, and it is it is woefully lacking when it comes to um, the, the cannabis specific um, legalization laws that we're seeing across the country. In some of the states that I mentioned, the reason that we can't even confirm how many people receive the benefit of the law that was passed is because it just said, do the thing and nobody tracked whether it happened. So we've been working in California for several years, which had one of the most robust resentencing provisions in, um, in its law. And nobody can tell whether people got significant sentence reductions at all, um, offense downgrades or releases from custody. And that's in California, <laughs> right? So imagine what the rest of the country looks like. So just a comment on that. It's, it's not an exciting side of the policy. The legalization side and the industry side of things is much flashier and sexy, but in order to actually tell um, if we've done the thing that we said we were going to do, we have to have um, oversight monitoring um, and data collection for these laws. Well, and, and so this will be my question. Uh, last one for now. And, and it up, uh, in, in one second, Sean, to other people in the audience, if they have some, some questions they want to ask, because we have a, a little bit of time left, 15 minutes or so, but I especially want to drill in, again, sentencing nerd, to recidivism. And in particular, and I you know, know a little bit of the data, but I know it, it is very, very incomplete that uh, some expungement work, this comes from a paper uh, developed out of Michigan, where people who got their records, though it was a petition-based system rather than an automated system um, for uh, records expunged, had lower recidivism rates, relatively speaking. Uh, my sense is the Sentencing Commission, U.S. Sentencing Commission has done some incredible recidivism studies, but I've got two concerns. One is the long timeline right, that to really judge recidivism, you're talking three, five, sometimes I think nine years is um, kind of the gold standard to make these judgments. And that's the rabbit running a long way ahead of folks to 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 have that analysis, especially in, in such dynamic times. The other is, I also sense, I don't know if any of you have this kind of data, it's again, where uh, I think there's so much work to do on data collection, you know, not all recidivism is the same, right? The technical violations that's often talked about a lot as, oh, we sent that person back to prison because they didn't comply with things that otherwise wouldn't be illegal, although there's certainly reason to fear that sometimes that's used just as cover as an easier way to get somebody remanded where there's an allegation that they were involved in other uh, criminal misconduct, but, but it was easier just to show a technical violation. Then there's the broader question. I think this is where the drug war also uh, sort of seeps into all that we do. Uh, is drug use, which is illegal, the kind of thing that we count as recidivism? Is it? If it is, it's. We shouldn't be surprised uh, to see higher recidivism rates among drug-involved individuals if they've long had uh, challenges with substances. And so, um, I sense both as a matter of craft and as even a matter of politics that recidivism is really important. But is this the? I'd love to hear some reactions on whether um, you know. I'm rightly worried that even if it's the great thing that we could focus on, it's not going to fit the sets of paradigms that 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 we need, partially because of data challenges, but partially because of just timeline challenges and these cycles, as you describe, you know, maybe speeding up as everything is in our society. So just sort of thoughts on, and Sean, I'm sorry I cut you off a little bit before if you want to sort of begin uh, with whatever point you wanted to make, but want to definitely get to this kind of recidivism idea, because I sense is 
whether judges articulated at sentencing, certainly I get a sense at resentencings or efforts to shorten sentences, um, you know, this comes to the fore and risk assessment tools that are widely debated are part of that equation too. And so um, that was a very long, not quite a question, but uh, Sean, go ahead. So uh, the only thing I wanted to say is, that, and with response to Gracie, is that there is an NIJ RFP out for research on resentencing. Um, so it's current. So if anyone's interested in that idea, you may want to talk to Gracie because it sounds like she knows a lot about data in that space. Um, but they are specifically looking for research on re resentencing kinds of policies. So uh, just to flag that for people. Um, the In terms of recidivism, I'm going to correct you a little bit, Doug, because this is an area I care a lot about. A couple things is that study that you mentioned in Michigan is not about recidivism. Um, it simply shows that people who have their records uh, cleared through a petition process have employment rates that look like they did um, uh, prior to uh, in, in, in they go up to where they were sort of before there was a dip. Um, so what happens is people are going along they they have a record, they're having employment, they have an employment crisis, they go and get rem remediation. Um, through this uh, process, and they return to where they were before with the record. So there was no control group of without a record. So this was, um, so it's, it isn't as good at evidence as for clean slate as people want to make it. And if you look at, read the paper carefully, they say yeah. that um, because there is no control group. Um, and there was a dip before they go and do the petition, and it's a dip that occurred while they have a record. So that's the first thing. Second thing is the Bureau of Justice Statistics and Statistics are not the right statistics for men, many of these conversations. And if you look at, uh, there's a RAND report that I helped write that sort of tries to address this. This is also something Rhodes has pointed out, because it's oversampling people that fail. It's, a high, it's the high risk or high rate recidivists that are being followed here. And you don't need to follow people for nine years to know to sort of have some idea about the, what the risks are. Um, and so I think, you know, it's important to ask questions. If you're interested in recidivism risk, then I think you have to focus on which population you care about, but particularly for discussions like um, Gracie was talking about for uh, re reintegration and reentry, the folk, the BJS statistics are probably the worst thing that ever happened to that um, because people start out with the statistic that says 80 million people have records and 90% of them fail by nine, in nine years after conviction. And so it makes it sound like everybody fails and that, you know, just do the math. If 80 million people have records and 80% and of them are active, um, how many you know, what would the conviction rate of the arrest rate be in this country? And it'd be a way higher than it is now. And that's because people stop, as Gracie said. And and so the, you have to look at those recidivism statistics from BJS for what they are, which is for your criminal justice purposes, and not for these kind of broader conversations, because the actual recidivism rate for the population we care about, say people free in society who have had a conviction record, is much lower. Um, and that's a really important thing to point out. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Sean. Jonathan? Um, a couple of points. Um, there was a lot packed into your statement question. Um, first, uh, a plug for sentencing commissions um, as data collection, um, research, and criminal law reform organizations. Not really doing what people think that they just should be doing, which is writing sentencing guidelines. I think where they have really succeeded, and, and I have a lot of negative things to say about the United States Sentencing Commission, but where it has incredibly succeeded is in collecting data um, and doing research. And um, and I think um, and I think commissions around the country have done that. And um, and then also about what I would call criminal law reform organizations. So when something is changed and there needs to be some um, commensurate change in the criminal code, somebody's paying attention, like somebody has that job. And, um, and that often can be um, a sentencing commission. On the recidivism research, I agree with Sean, I don't think you have to wait eight or nine years. I mean, the great uh, uh, at the federal level, um, the federal commission has done multiple um, uh, recidivism research studies of people who have been released early. Um, because their sentences, they were resentenced for reduced crack cocaine sentencing guidelines. Um, and they show a very, very clear pattern. Um, and so if you combine 
um, risk level and known patterns, you can see whether the pattern is holding very quickly. You don't have to wait until it goes out to nine years. And if you, if any of you know what these curves look like, um, you know, the recidivism happens quickly and then it flattens out. You don't have to wait until you're at the end of the curve when it's all completely flattened out to know um, whether things are changing or not changing. Now, of course, you need to understand the population, but we now have risk tools that allow us to understand it. And we have other data systems that allow us to understand the population that we're studying. So I think there can be much quicker reviews um, of recidivism and, and, and quicker research studies on that. Oh, well, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not in, 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 in so many people said yesterday, but yeah, I think um, the the clean slate work is um, separate from recidivism, like Sean said, but but particularly important because when we're talking about building proof of concept for a policy, um, it's really helpful to show um, the barriers that can be reduced to reintegrating people um, back into society. So I think, you know, um, JJ and Sonia's work out of Michigan is really helpful in that regard. Um, I think particularly around recidivism, um, it's it's it goes back to the body of research um, that is supporting the second look policies um, that I mentioned. There's a lot of research just around um, how, you know, incarceration doesn't promote public safety. Um, it's not just that it doesn't affect it, it's that it does not promote it. <laughs> it um, you know, we're locking people up for, in some cases, nonviolent drug offenses for a long time, in, in, a, in most other cases for, for quote unquote violent offenses, right? But regardless, for, for long periods of time and then releasing them um, into society where they're barred from employment, from, you know, benefits, from housing, and then we're expecting them to not recidivate. So I think, you know, it's particularly helpful to look um, at the body of evidence supporting second look policies that show that incarceration just doesn't promote public safety and what can. Wonderful. Well, I've saved five minutes for some Q&A from the audience. If anybody wants to throw their hand out, sir. Uh, Jonathan, I appreciate your pitch for more research on but but I was a bit concerned that all the examples you gave of what I would consider the supply side orientations that back up to more interdiction and more enforcement rather than potentially demand side investigations. So my question is do you see an equal value for research that looks at well who is using drugs in a harmful way? How are they using them in a harmful way? Why are they, you know, and the value of, you know, community-based, public health-based interventions and reducing those harms. So, for instance, you know, Sean mentioned increases in marijuana usage, but are they harmful increases? And some of the research shows that it's actually replacing alcohol usage, which actually might be a net benefit for public health. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I, and, and if I gave the impression it's all about supply and enforcement, I, I apologize. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's that kind of research and knowledge that provides answers to politicians who have to respond to a political imperative. And if there's a good answer, um, it, and it's usually not just don't worry about it. Everything's okay over here. If they're looking at it, something's wrong. Okay. If it's not wrong, they're not looking at it. Okay. So something's wrong. There's a policy problem that's been identified and they're looking at it and they want to know what's wrong and how do I make it better? And if it, and if it's about the demand side, I, I think that can be very, very important. And there have been lots and lots of, there's lots and lots of legislation and there are lots and lots of levers that um, legislators can pull to address some of that. And a lot of that is funding of community-based programming and all, all kinds of other things. Some of which, by the way, we again have to recognize and have humility to know that sometimes they're not gonna work. And so we have to have studies. So someone's gonna say, okay, maybe what we should do is send police officers into elementary schools and tell, every, tell all the kids how drugs are bad. Okay, and then I know it sounds stupid now, but at the time it sounded like a great idea. <laughs> okay, let's do it. And we do it, and then you have to have the ability to keep researching and say, okay, that didn't work, now let's try something else. 
Um, that's the kind of world that I actually live in. And so, um, yes, that kind of research important on an ongoing basis. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in. I thought it was a spectacular question. One of the challenges when we all talk about data and we all talk about the need for better data is realizing different institutions are going to focus on different kinds of data. And if you give money to a sentencing commission, they're going to look at criminal justice stuff. You give it to a public health commission, they're going to look at public health stuff. And not only are they going to dig into these stories differently, they're not going to communicate with each other effectively. And they have their own both virtuous and parochial biases that can sometimes impact, you know, the way they look at these problems. And I will say that our center is specifically designed to try to bring these folks together in these kinds of conversations, but it's really hard because the public health people look at problems certain ways, the criminal justice people look at other problems other ways, and, and to put those all together can, can be a big part of the, the equation. So, but thank you very much for the question. One more question, if there's anyone who wants to get us in. If not, then, oh, okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, research, um, love to hear about uh, the current state of uh, the discussions on conditions of confinement and behind the wall interventions and um, is maybe how the Department of Justice and state legislatures and researchers are grappling with that question. You want to do 40 seconds on the First Step Act a little? I mean, it's yeah, so um, Congress passed and President Trump signed into law in 2018, uh, a law that was really focused on, I think, what you call behind the wall um, interventions, uh, corrections reform. Um, that was, I would say, 85 to 90 percent of the First Step Act. And it, it included some various different ideas. It required the Bureau of Prisons not only to have programming, to study the programming, um, to experiment, to use risk assessment tools. There's all kinds of aspects of that. And, um, and then also to issue a report every year about it. Um, and so there's a lot of work being done at the federal level on this. Um, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, COVID obviously got in the way of almost everything and uh, including all of those reforms at the Bureau of Prisons, but um, there's a lot more to do, um, but some of that is happening. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists and getting today off to a great start. I think our next panel starts right away. So Carissa, come on up and uh, we will get out of your way. And thanks so much. Thank you, John, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, sir, that was wonderful Thank as always. You. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.